pray. Father, thank you for all you do for us. Thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. Thank you for allowing us to bring our gifts and our talents. And in spite of the other stuff we bring, you allow us to be used. Help us as we yield our hearts, yield our spirits, our motives, and our intent to you. Would you guide and would you direct? We sure do love you. Thank you. Amen. Second Kings. We're going to start in Second Kings this morning. I was about to make fun of Ryan in his Super Bowl Bears jacket, and then I remembered I'm a Lions fan. <sighs> hmm. Before you were born. But don't worry. It was before I was born, too. Second Kings 16, 29 through 34. Second Kings chapter 16. We're going to start in verses 29 through 34. Well, let me get to the right book. There is not a 29 through 34 in Second Kings. I think I've done this to myself twice this morning. Wrote it down. Let's try First Kings. There we go. I wrote an extra one. First Kings. It was hard enough to find Second Kings, right? Like, come on, man. I started off when I started preparing this. I started writing Chronicles. So I turned there to refresh. I'm like, man, it's not even close. We're talking about David again. So we're in 1 Kings, chapter 16, starting verse 29. We'll start in verse 28. So Omri slept with his fathers and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab, his son, reigned in his stead. And in the 30 and 8th year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 20 and 2 years. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass... As it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. In his days did Hiel the Beth- Bethelite build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof, and Abiram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof, and his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. All right. So you got the, one, the two players on one side of the equation already laid out. Ahab, and he married Jezebel. There's tons of jokes and thoughts about Jezebel. I just want to point out that when Ahab married her, he knew she followed Baal before he married her. So he knew what he was getting into. When, And then as they got to know each other, he starts following her God. So that's how we get to the end of this chapter. And then we read chapter 17, verses 1 through 6. And Elijah, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years but according to my word. And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord, for he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. So this is one of the first miracles you get to see Elijah enjoy. Elijah the Tishbite, God has Elijah go talk to Ahab and say, there's not going to be rain. And then God tells Elijah, and you're probably going to want to hide because he's going to be looking for you and want to kill you. So Elijah hides, and he has ravens feed him. That's the rest of chapter 17, and then we'll also get into, and we won't get into, but you can read it a later time, that Elijah also is told, now go find a widow woman, and she's going to feed you. And she's not going to have enough food to cover her son and her for a last meal, but I'm going to sustain you. Just let her know. As soon as you feed me, that barrel of meal and the water won't end 
the, um, actually the oil won't end until the drought is gone. And that's chapter 17. So God sends Elijah back to Ahab in chapter 18. To get the full story you're going to want, we'll need to read the entire chapter. I'll try to do it uh, with emotion as we're teaching my daughter how to read. So you can uh, get a little bit of the full story going on in 1 Kings 18. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab, and there was a sore famine in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. For it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took an hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said unto Obadiah, Go into the land and unto all the fountains of water and unto all the brooks. Peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my lord, Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, What have I sinned, that thou wouldest deliver my servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said he is not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, Go tell my Lord, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass, as soon as I am gone from thee, that the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee away, whither I know not. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, he shall slay me. But I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. Was it not told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord? How I hid an hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifty in a cave, and fed them with bread and water? And now thou sayest, Go, tell thy Lord. Behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. And Elijah said, As the Lord of hosts liveth, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself unto him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou, in thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now therefore send and gather me all Israel into Mount Carmel, and the prophets of Baal four hundred and fifty, and the prophets of the groves four hundred, which eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together into Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets till the blood gushed upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, that there was neither voice, nor any to answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him, and he, was, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill four barrels with water, bless you, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it the third time. And they did it the third time. And the water ran around about the altar, and he filled the trench also with water. 
And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is the God. The Lord, he is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slew them there. And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he cast himself down upon the earth, and he put his face between his knees, and said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There is nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And it came to pass at the seventh time that he said, Behold, there ariseth a little cloud out of the sea like a man's hand. And he said, Go up, say unto Ahab, Prepare thy chariot, and get thee down, that the rain stop thee not. And it came to pass in the meanwhile, that the heaven was black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. You read a couple of different parts of this chapter, I'd like to point out. Verse 22, the Bible says, Elijah said unto the people, even I only remain a prophet. You'll want to remember that. And you see this wonderful miracle that God uses Elijah to do. You see the boldness of Elijah to come, and God said, go tell Ahab this. And so Ahab does, or Elijah does. And he says, we're going to have a competition. And this competition is, whosoever God comes through, that's the God you should serve. And you, you do see Elijah making fun of the prophets of Baal, mocking them. Maybe your God's sleeping. It's a little humorous. But then you see Elijah say, all right, God, if you're the God I serve and you're the Lord, come down and take up the sacrifice. And you see the sacrifice taken up. Wouldn't you think Elijah would be ready to do whatever God commanded him after that? Oh, and at the end of the story, the waters come back. The rain comes and takes care of the drought. The children of Israel aren't in a drought anymore. We're going to read the first couple verses of chapter 19 and then have a conversation. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die and said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. Bless you. Elijah had just been used by God to bring in a drought for three years. God had fed Elijah by ravens. Then God had fed Elijah by the miracle at the widow's house. Then God had used Elijah to just do a mighty act in front of all the children of Israel where fire comes down from heaven and consumes a very specific amount of stuff, the sacrifice, just as Elijah had asked. Then you hear Jezebel get into the picture, and Jezebel threatens Elijah. And what's Elijah's response? Oh, I'm not worried about that. God's taken care of me up to this point. What do I have to fear this saying for? No, he and I react, he reacted like you and I would. You know, a lot of what we do and what we experience, you can look in Scripture and you can find our emotional state being played out. Most of us would look at Elijah and have heard sermons preached in the past about how Elijah just lost his faith, didn't have enough faith. As soon as Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you, he just ran like a coward and 
That's what Elijah was. That's, at that point, he struggled with his faith. But I want to look at it and go, doesn't that sound pretty normal? We get to this point in our Christian life where God's done great works in our lives. He's done miracles and friends and family around us. We've seen health struggles taken care of. We've seen answers to prayer. We've seen him work in a ton of different ways. But then we get into an emotional frame of mind and into a place of distress where we look at it and say, God, are you really even working in my life? It's not worth being alive. I mean, this frustration, it's just not worth it. And we get to a place of mental discouragement that is pretty normal. You know, there's a reason the Bible tells us don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's not just because someone's supposed to preach and deliver a sermon. It's so we can help each other lift each other up. It's so we can look at each other and say, hey, I'd like to pray for you. I have prayed for you. I'd like to also encourage you. I see myself in this. I see us. I see you and me and Elijah serving God, putting the time and effort into making his kingdom important in our lives. And then we have the pressure build up. It can discourage, dishearten, and temporarily it can disable us. We have the emotions get in the way of anything God wants to do. We have the pressures of life get in the way of God's ability in our lives. You know, I, I want to encourage you in this. God's reaction to Elijah wasn't say, you're useless to me anymore. You're done. Yeah, I'll, I'll just take you. God's reaction to Elijah was to say, I'm not done. My hand's not weakened. I didn't fail. Just because there's pressure and stress in your life right now, that doesn't mean I'm not working. I want to encourage you today. Before you think you're alone in this emotional valley, consider what many of David's writings are. You know, you look at David and you can see just a man of great faith. But if you actually read his writings, you have to understand he and I, he went through the same emotional struggles you and I do. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. You read Psalm 3, verses 4 and 5. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Why would someone cry unto the Lord? Because they were in distress. Because the pressures of life were overwhelming. Because the situations they were in in life were too much for them to handle. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. I laid me down and slept. I awaked. For the Lord sustained me. It's a question you and I have to consider consistently. Are we bringing this stress and just allowing it to build up and taking responsibility for it as if we're the only ones that can deal with it? Are we allowing the pressure to just continue to build until we're just too stressed to be of any use in our lives? Or... Are we, like David, crying unto the Lord? Are you taking enough time to cry unto the Lord? We're going to turn to Psalm chapter 6. Psalm chapter 6. Psalm 6, verses 1 through 6. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I, make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears." That sounds like a man that experienced the same emotion you and I do, that experienced the same turmoil and strife that you and I do. Was God's response to David to ignore him, 
act as though you're this weak individual. I'm not able to use you, so I'm just going to cast you aside. Never. I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. So what's the difference? Most of the time, it's just the concept that we try to do it ourselves. We don't cry unto the Lord. We don't bring our stress to the place where we can get rid of it. And most of us read 1 Kings chapter 16 and 17, and we think less of Elijah because of his fear. I mean, it's Jezebel, right? She was the queen of the nation that he lived in. It would have been a stressful time. Be similar to Mr. Trump looking at us and saying, all right, you're done. Time for you to no longer live. You know, I thought less of Elijah as well. And then I considered how God interacted with him. God didn't dismiss him because of his turmoil. He didn't say, all right, no more use in Elijah. We got to go look for his replacement. He said, no, I'm still God. I'm still in control here. You know, turn back to 1 Kings chapter 19. So that we finished in verse 4, and the Bible says in verse 5, And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said unto him, Arise and eat. And he looked, behold, there was a cake baking on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. So we're going to pause and notice. What was it that the angel of the Lord had Elijah do? Well, first off, he was sleeping. And second off, he was eating. We con commonly forget there's stress going on in life. Okay, you still need to sleep right. You still need to eat right. You still need to take care of yourself. If emotions are overwhelming, okay, have you gotten eight hours of sleep? Have you allowed your body the opportunity to reset? Or are you trying to do this on your own? Have you placed your burden in Christ's lap and said, all right, it's yours, taking care of your body? We're going to continue. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat 40 days and 40 nights. Thankfully, God doesn't put us to that task very often. I don't know if you've ever tried a fast. You get to two meals and it's like, uh, really? Oh, uh, three? We want to go three meals. Oh, I'm not sure about that. 40 days and 40 nights. Verse 9, and he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? That's a good question for you and I to ask. What are you doing here? Are you here so you can impress everybody with your ability and spirituality? I'm so impressive. I can do this facade perfectly. I've got the right clothes, I've got the right conversation. I've got the right attitude, supposedly. I can put on a show. God looks at Elijah and goes, what's your intention? Why are you here? What doest thou here, Elijah? Verse 10. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Are you the only one that's right around you? You know, it's not uncommon for some moments of life to feel like that. Am I the only one here doing this? Am I the only one in my family wanting to do this? Am I the only one at work that wants to live this way? And to feel isolated, to feel alone. Even Elijah, one of the greatest prophets used by God. I'm the only one here. We're going to continue. Verse 11, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind, and after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, 
a still small voice. Isn't that life? We have all these big things going on in our life and big emotional reactions, big actions, big opportunities. And God comes to us in a still small voice. That unless we've taken the time to shed the cares of this world, we're not hearing. We're not listening. Continuing. Verse 13, And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of, in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Did he get it? No. Same response. It just replays in my mind how our life works. God says, hey, I'd like to work in your life today. I'd like to work in your heart today. And he gives us a lesson. And then afterwards, did you get it? No, I'm the only one here, God. I'm the only one trying to serve you. But you know what? He doesn't stop. He doesn't give up on us. He doesn't stop using us. Verse 15, And the Lord said unto him, Go return on thy way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when thou comest, anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, son of Nimshi, shalt thou anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Mahola, shalt thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapeth the sword of Hazael shall Jehu slay, and him that escapeth from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which hath not kissed him. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Bless you. You notice God's response to Elijah in his struggle? He sends a person to minister unto him, Elisha. It wasn't, I'm, I'm not using you anymore, you're done. You have this struggle that you have going on in your spirit and in your heart. And I'm just not going to use someone like that. He says, no, I'm going to care for you. I'm going to look out. I'm going to send someone along the way to minister unto you. God looked out for his mental and emotional state and sent Elisha. I'm going to turn over to Psalm chapter 9 and verse 9. Psalm 9, 9. The Bible says, The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. Are you taking your stress, the pressure, the turmoil, where it needs to go? Are you laying it down? Are you allowing it to be released? Are you stuck in this vacuum thinking everybody's out to get you, everybody's against you, and you're the only one doing right? Where are you? Have you, like Elijah, done the work of the Lord, and God, I've served you, I've tried to do right, I'm trying to take my family the right path, and I'm trying to serve you how you've asked me to, and I'm just, I'm spent, I'm done. And God's looking at you going, don't worry, I'll help you. I won't leave you in this emotional state. You know, God is looking out for us but we have to allow him to. We have to let the people around us minister unto us. Even Elijah needed Elisha. He needed that help. You think of the song, Is there a heart or bound by sorrow? Is there a life overwhelmed with care? Come to the cross, each burden bearing. All your anxiety, leave it there. Have you done that? Have you taken the emotional struggles going on and said, all right, God, I know you don't want me to live in this spirit of fear, anxiety, 
I need to leave it. Psalm 103, 13 and 14, like as a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. For he knoweth our frame, he remembereth that we are dust. God isn't looking at us, shaking his head, going, you know, if you'd only get it right, I'm so frustrated with you. He's looking at us going, I created you. I knew what stress would be placed on you. But I also gave you a place to run. I gave you a help in time of trouble. Stop taking it all on yourself and allow someone to help you. We need to have this understanding that as we endeavor to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, we're supposed to bring our cares to Him. I don't know that I could consider making it a week without Him. How long has it been? Have you taken the cares of this world, brought them to a place, and allowed God to help you? Or is it all your responsibility? Is it all yours to bear? And then one last place. 1 Kings 21. Verses 27 through 29. We're going to start in verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. And he did very abominably in following idols, according to all things as did the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. And it came to pass, when Ahab heard those words, He was being told he was going to lose the kingdom. When he heard those words, that he rent his clothes and put sackcloth upon his flesh and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went softly. And the word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Seest thou how Ahab humbleth himself before me? Because he humbleth himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil upon his house." You know, one of the struggles you and I would have, if Elijah were like us, we'd want Ahab cared for like he should be. And the Lord looks at him and goes, no, like I've been merciful to you, I'm going to be merciful to him. Like I've allowed you to have my mercy and grace, I'm going to allow him to have it too. If the Lord isn't judging another person, We don't have that right either. Elijah could have used this and said, you know what, God, I'm done. Done serving you. Done taking care of your people. I'm done looking out for your things. I'm just done. But Elijah had at least seen the mercy of the Lord in his life and was aware that it's the Lord's ability to use people and not our judgment of others. I'm grateful like Ahab, I have God's forgiveness in my life. Don't deserve it. But he gives it anyway. I just want to encourage you tonight, today, this morning. It's weird to have the sun, it's messing with my mind. I just want to encourage you. As you're going through this thing called life, don't let the cares of the world take over your emotions. At the end of the day, is it really that big a deal? We'll get to have another day of existence, another opportunity. Tomorrow's going to be a brand new day, and we can leave the cares of the world at Christ's feet. Encourage one another. Strengthen one another. Lift each other up. Look out for each other in love. If you have the opportunity, you you don't see someone in the pews, call them. Say, hey, was praying for you. Missed you today. I want to encourage you. If you have an offense between you and someone else, you know, allow God to have the ability to use them 
just like you want God to have the ability to use you. You know, we read in Matthew chapters 6 and 7, instruction on we're supposed to forgive. I want to encourage you today, forgive. Let the offense go. And give yourself over to being used by God the way he intended you to. We're going to stand. We're going to have an opportunity. For-